thank you to the CNS uh, for inviting me to prepare this video uh, on open Scolbis approaches. I am uh, Dr. Fernando Miranda, uh, Professor and Chief of Scolbis Theory at Stanford University. These are my conflicts of interest for this lecture. Um, modern Scolbis Theory is about selecting the proper approach for each individual case. And we discuss often between transcranial and endonasal approaches. And if you want to devise an easy classification of one of open skulls approaches, uh, we have here uh, six uh, categories of open skulls approaches against one single category of endonasal approaches. This is, in my opinion, the importance of endonasal surgery these days to access many skull based lesions, as important as these other six approaches. But we need to master them all as skull based uh, surgeons. In this lecture, which is only 15 minutes, I do not have time to see a lot of the videos, uh, so I'm going to skip to them, but you can access some of them uh, through different <clears throat> media platforms. First, I want to talk about <clears throat> the subfrontal transbasal approach. It's an approach to the cruciform region, frontal sinus, and this is an approach that can be uh, modified, as you see that craniotomy being done there. First, of course, we do a bicranial incision, and then the craniotomy is key to do it very low along the uh, supraorbital rim and down to the level of the nation and frontoethmoidal suture. That will allow you to get all the way to the base of the anterior skull base, take the crista galli, transect the uh, folks before there is even any superior sagittal sinus, and then get into the tumor in an extradural, intradural combined fashion. It's a powerful approach. I mostly use it for uh, giant olfactory group numbers like this one allows you to do pericranial flap reconstruction. And uh, um, importantly, you need to uh, know how to cranialize completely a frontal sinus, take whole posterior table of the frontal sinus, and then uh, patch the, with a muscle graft, the frontoethmoidal recesses, and then use a large pericranial graft for isolation of the frontal sinus from the intracranial cavity. Uh, this is an approach that we also use often for uh, sinonasal malignancies in combination with endonasal approaches very commonly. Some of these tumors are very extensive, like this one. Actually, you have to exanterate the frontal sinuses, not just cranialize them, uh, and give, give you access to both medial sides of the orbit, to the sinuses from above is needed. Uh, so this is, of course, a very powerful approach that we uh, need to uh, master. Lest Next, let's move to the area of the plantar sphenoidal and tuberculum cella region. Uh, for me, tuberculum cella meningiomas, most of them I like to do endonasally, but plantar meningiomas, I like to do them, most of them through an open approach. And uh, the reason is because the tumors are mostly supracasmatic, and there is not significant benefit of going endonasal. There is benefit on the infracasmatic space, but not so much in the supracasmatic. I like to do these tumors, especially when they are large, through an orbitofrontal approach. That means just simply taking the, the uh, rim, orbital rim, the superior orbital rim, is going to give you excellent wide skull base access. Um, and this minimizes the frontal lobe retraction. I tell patients often, I prefer to give you a blue eye after the operation, which is just uh, a matter of one or two weeks of having blue eye versus a blue brain, which, is, which can have permanent sequelae. This is a tumor that is not large, but even though in a case like this, I might take the orbital rim, to minimize the frontal lobe uh, manipulation. You see how uh, low the exposure is, the orbital ring has been removed, the dura has been folded over the orbit, and this gives me beautiful access to the whole anterior skull base. I can open the falciform lumen as you see there, I can detach the tumor, I can cut the, that's the cerebral folk, so I can access the contralateral side. This allows me to preserve olfaction. Uh, the contralateral nerve is gonna be preserved very nicely, and I can take all the dura of the skull base and do a very wide uh, skull base uh, resection. And again, with no fist retraction, no manipulation of the frontal lobe, and patients do better this way uh, because of this little manipulation. There are cases that <clears throat> I would rather do with just an eyebrow craniotomy, uh, an eyebrow incision. The craniotomy is the same, it's smaller. So your tumor is very tall. You're going to have difficulties getting access there. Uh, you can take the rim of the orbit also in the eyebrow uh, approach, but there is no need in this case that you see here, for example, for this small uh, meningioma right on top of the optic canal. Not good for endonasal, ideal for an eyebrow craniotomy. I can get a nice exposure all the way from above. I can see the optic canal. 
I can open it very nicely and uh, also minimal retraction on the frontal lobe. So the eyebrow incision is a modification of that frontal orbital uh, exposure. A more challenging area, paraclinoidal region, middle cranial fossa, cavernous sinus with the potential extension of the petrous apex. Um, here's when we use the very, very powerful approach, the extended middle fossa approach with all its different variants. And uh, uh, I must say that I use a lot also the endonasal transterior approach, but that's mostly for uh, chondrous lesions, while the extended middle fossa approach is mostly for meningiomas and other tumors like that. Um, here, the key anatomy concept is you need to know how to unlock the cavernous sinus, how to go from this picture here where the dura or the temporal lobe is all covered to this picture where you have all the cranial nerves at the skull base exposed and the cranial carotid exposed, etc. First, it starts with a craniotomy. We do the peeling of the temporal lobe dura, uh, so we expose the meningovital dural fold. Once we transect this fold, we can expose the cranial uh, uh, the clinoid process uh, really well and the suprabital fissure. We do a clinoidectomy extradurally, which exposes the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery and the optic nerve within the optic canal, which is now unroofed. And now we can continue doing the peeling of the middle fossa from anterior to posterior all the way to Meckel's cave uh, is needed, if needed. And a key maneuver I'll show you also is this transection of the anterior petroclinoidal ligament, which frees up the third nerve as it enters the roof of the cavernous sinus. We can put all of this in practice in this case. It's a typical anterior clinal meningioma. There is no need in this case to do an orbital uh, segomatic or orbital frontal approach. The orbital rim is, remains there. Uh, but we are doing a middle force approach. <clears throat> and then the first thing is we find the middle meningeal artery, which helps us mobilize the uh, temporal lobe. Now I am dissecting nicely the anterior clinal process. And now we're going to do this drilling in an extradural fashion. And this drilling allows me to first decompress the optic canal very early. Second, identify the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery also at the beginning of the operation. Then we do an opening in the dura that is tailored to the extension of the tumor, also minimizing the frontal or temporal lobe manipulation. And very early on the operation, because of our clinoidectomy, we can find the optic nerve. And opti we open first the falciform ligament. Here, there is a sequence of three events that I always do. One, falciform ligament opening, find the optic nerve. Two, distal dural ring uh, uh, transection, or just parallel cut along the distal dural ring, so you can find the supracranial carotid artery. And finally, uh, three, is the transection of the anterior pitocranial ligament after I find the third nerve. And that is the key maneuver to free up the third nerve and to detach uh, the tumor. So here we have done exposure of the carotid artery, there the clinoidal, but now I'm going to find the third nerve uh, right in here, which is compressed by the tumor, and then this is when we do our transection with this red angle knife, we can just transect the petroclinoidal ligament, and this detaches the tumor uh, completely, and the rest of the operation remains uh, uh, quite simple. And you see most of the approach is done in an extradural fashion. Now, we have other tumors. There's another type of sclerodal meningioma that is much taller. If the tumor is much taller like this one, then I'm going to do an orbitosegomatic, uh, an orbitoterional approach. Um, so in this case, a terional craniotomy with the orbital rim. Not the zygoma, but just the orbital rim. And this gives you extra space. And it's the same operation. We do an operation to take the anterior canal process, as we said. Again, optic nerve, carotid artery. I like to cut the dura along the frontal temporal fold, along the same line of the sylvian fissure, because all, that's all the brain I need to expose. And then I can dissect the tumor of the carotid artery in a case like this, there is a good plane of dissection. But having the carotid exposed on the clonodal space is what is key for me to uh, be able to identify the carotid artery early and then dissect the tumor away and get a nice resection uh, like this one. Um, there are tumors that are, you know, like this, where the temporal lobe is going to have to be manipulated extensively. This is a cavernous sinus hemangioma, large one. And in this case, we're going to do an orbitosigomatic approach. And there is uh, there are two variants of this, the full OC, as you know, or the just the Z, just the zygoma, if you need to go low on the medial, uh, uh, on the temporal lobe area, but not in the frontal lobe. So remember, orbital bar for frontal lobe uh, retraction, minimizing it, zygomatic for temporal lobe uh, damage minimi minimization. Uh, so 
in the in a case like this, this patient we did a full OC because we need to do a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, manipulation to remove this tumor and block. And this is after complete tumor resection of this uh, case with an orbital segment approach and a middle fossa approach. This other meningioma, however, there is not much frontal extension. I'm going to do just the C, just the zygomatic uh, osteotomy is what I need to do in this particular case. You see the extension of this tumor, which, by the way, you see how it grew from a very small cavernous meningioma to a, this very large in just uh, 18 months. It was, of course, a great tumor meningioma. And in this case, we need to understand how to add the petrosectomy, which is the last addition to this middle fossa approach, where you know about the uh, the section of the middle fossa exposing the petrocepix rhomboid and drilling it with the landmarks that you need to remember, geniculate ganglion, GSPN, petrus carotid, internal acoustic canal posteriorly. And then this allows me to open the dura uh, and follow the fifth nerve into Meckel's cave and join the uh, posterior uh, fossa with the middle fossa for these uh, complex uh, scolbis meningiomas like, uh, like this one. And... Uh, this is the nice post-op with nice resection, except some tumor residual around the posterior clinal process and Durello's canal. Um, now I'm going to move to the posterior skull based approaches. The four categories I'm going to review, retrosigmoid, combined transpetrosal, and extreme or far lateral approach. Um, the retrosigmoid approach, of course, is a workhorse for the posterior fossa. We use it most commonly. It's such a versatile approach because you can go along the lateral wall, the uh, uh, cerebellum, the convex, cerebellar convexity on the petrous region, but you can go all the way up to the cerebellum, supracerebellar surface, along the tentorium, you can drill the petrous apex, you can cut the tentorium, you can use an endoscope to get uh, um, extended view, you can go all the way to the dorsum cella. It's such a powerful approach. And uh, you can see an example here, this uh, uh, petroclalum and uh, the disadvantage in this, team, in this approach is that uh, the facial nerve as you will see here, and the vestibulocochlear complex are posterior to the tumor. So you're going to have to work in a corridor where the nerves are contained, are posterior displaced towards you. This is a cosmetic mastoidectomy that we're doing in this particular case, um, which I do when I do these extended versions, uh, then to put this uh, bone piece back. Uh, but it's very important to do a very good uh, exposure of the uh, sigmoid sinus, as you see right here. And this is the key to really mobilize the sinus anteriorly and get excellent exposure. And I'm going to simply uh, to move along so you uh, does the trigeminal nerve superiorly. But this thing you see here, these are the 7 and 8 complex. And you see they're in your way and, and you're going to be manipulating them during the approach. You need to be very careful. And they are an anterior and you go very posterior and therefore you uh, can damage them without uh, other, uh, you know uh, realizing. So very careful uh, for these uh, cases when the tumor displays the facial nerve posteriorly. But here is after the operation, um, that six nerve, lower nerve, seven and eight, and uh, complete tumor resection in this uh, pitoclam and through a retrosigmoid approach. Patient does have some facial palsy, grade three uh, facial palsy, but then recovers uh, uh, really well. Now, when tumors are larger, like it happens, for example, in this one, uh, then you need to rely on the transpetrosal approach. This is a, a, this tumor goes too high on the middle fossa, a lateral for a retrosigmoid approach only. And if you're going to uh, do this with a larger resection, you need a combined transpetrosal like this one. It's centered around the ear, as you see. Very important to do a posteriorly based pedicle flap, pedicle flap for reconstruction of the middle fossa and mastoid region. This is the exposure. Uh, there are different ways of doing this craniotomy, but basically you need to expose the dura of the middle fossa and the posterior fossa with then a mastoidectomy that will completely expose the uh, sigmoid sinus. You need to, you're you going to open the dura in front of the sigmoid sinus, that we call this a pre-sigmoid approach. In this case, a pre-sigmoid approach with a middle fossa extension. And uh, you see the middle fossa, you do the same middle fossa you did before approach. You do it in this situation to access the tumor. You're going to do anterior petrosectomy, is you need it, you're going to do a posterior petrosectomy, that's what we call it, a combined transpetrosal, both anterior and posterior. And the beauty of this approach is it gives you access, after you cut the tentorium, as you see here, it gives you access to both the, and the middle fossa, posterior fossa, and in case you're so close to the pathology. And this highly challenging tumor becomes much more doable with this 
highly complex approach that sometimes we have to do in two separate stages. You see, we are opening there Meckel's cave um, and uh, you follow five um, into the uh, Meckel's cave. And not, we are now flashed with a uh, clipal region to remove this tumor and see directly the basilar artery and that it, dissect the tumor from the basilar perforators, which is the key, most challenging part of this, of this particular uh, operation. And uh, you see at the end, you see the cranial nerve nearly exposed and preserved. And this is a reconstruction. And this is the uh, post-op. So the combined transpetrosal approach for this highly complex uh, petroclamin in Yomas is to this day my preferred approach. And then finally, farlar approach for farming and Yoma. This is uh, another workhorse we use for um, these cases. Um, the key here is to understand how to fully expose the vertebral artery along C1 arch and then maximize the drilling of the foramen macrum rim all the way to the condyle, identify your uh, condylar vein right here. And then as we open the dura, you can fold it and you can see the vertebral artery entering the dura. And that is the key. You want to have good control of the vertebral artery, good visualization. Uh, also, you need to understand and recognize the different nerves like C2 versus spinal accessory and C1 nerves because some of them you can transect like C1, C2. But of course, the spinal accessory nerve and all its branches need to be meticulously uh, preserved. And uh, I'm just going to show you, I'm going to jump how we, you, this drilling of the, uh, uh, towards the condyle allows me to get access towards the jugular foramen and above the hepatoglossal canal to remove that last attachment of the tumor working above and, ab and below the uh, vertebral artery. So you barely drill any condyle, but you drill up to the condyle, which is the key in this uh, in this operation. And a variant of this is the extreme lateral approach, also co called anterolateral approach, and transcervical anterolateral approach uh, to the cranocervical junction. You can see this recurrent uh, chordoma. Um, the incision is different, so it goes into the into the uh, neck just in front of the uh, esternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is what allows you to, uh, you know, access the cervical junction from a lateral exposure, as we call it anterolateral. You can access anterior to the cervical spine. You can take uh, the odontic process this way, uh, as we need to do in this highly uh, complex cordoma. This video has been recently published, uh, or will be published. You can review it here because we are running out of time. Uh, but you see the incision. This patient had previous operations, but we extended the incision down and we got into this uh, 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 tumor for a complete uh, resection followed by a cervical fusion. So this is a summary, a uh, quick tour over the main approaches, open approaches and categories that you need to uh, incorporate into your practice for uh, successful outcomes. Thank you very much.